Hey, everybody. I'm Robin Russo, and I am one of the course designers for Nova's English 121. So I have with me today Alexandra Garcia from the New York Times. I'll let her introduce herself and tell us about her current role. Hello. Um, I am Alex Garcia. Um, I'm currently a supervising producer at the New York Times Opdocs. Um, Opdocs is a series of short films made by independent filmmakers, um, short documentaries that we curate and then publish on the New York Times. Um, it's a relatively new role for me. I started about seven months ago, um, so I'm learning a ton about you know, the film festival world and short film world. And it's sort of a job that straddles journalism and documentary, which are very different, actually. Weirdly, like I, I always thought that we were doing the same things. Like when I was a video journalist before, I was always like, oh, we're doing doc, we're making mini documentaries. But now I know that the work is can be kind of similar, but the world is very different. So I'm learning a, a new world. Can you tell us a little bit about like what a typical day or week might be if there is any such thing in such a new role? Yeah, um, I'll give you, let's see. A typical day usually involves, I would say like 30% of my time about is spent watching work. So watching films. So this is watching films from film festivals that we've gotten the links to. And so we're watching and seeing if there are any films from these festivals that we want to acquire um, or their pitches like rough drafts or assemblies that have been submitted to the New York Times that people want additional help to, to finish them. And they want to know if we want to publish them. So like watching some finished work, some really rough work, some like very preliminary work, like occasionally we get paper pitches um, which is where people are like pitching a project and seeing if we want to get involved from the very early stages um, before they've even filmed anything. Um, so part of my job is assessing work. Then once we decide we want to, if we're going to acquire something or if we're going to work with a filmmaker, um, a big part of my job as a supervising producer is to work on edit notes with the filmmakers. And so they will send me drafts and we will talk about what's working and the structure, what's unclear, what's not working and work together to like make the best possible finished short film for the internet, which is, it's really interesting because I worked in, I've worked in digital video now since 2007 about. Um, and so I feel like, you know, it's a, it's a very different aesthetic and it's a very different you have a very different understanding of like whether you're going to watch something in a theater you're going to make one thing which is I think a lot of these short filmmakers are used to making stuff for a theater where if you're making something for the internet um it sometimes requires a, a slightly different edit so we're working together on those um but I went to art school so I feel like I have like an artist's heart so I feel like I'm I'm always I'm always like don't worry we're not gonna ruin your <laughs> <laughs> make it webby, you know, make it just like webby for no reason. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so that's another part of my um, job. Another part of my job is going to film festivals. Um, so I just got back from a couple of festivals, uh, one in Greece and one in Italy. Um, and this is watching work from film fest from smaller film festivals, from filmmakers from regions where their their films are maybe not going to the to the big festivals. Um, and it's good to do that because I feel like we're, tr we're trying to expand more internationally. Something that's really interesting about our strategy is that we've actually noticed that people, I think for a long time, you know, I worked for the New York Times television show for a while and, and for a long time, people were scared of things with subtitles. People were like, well, people don't want to watch things with subtitles. And we actually haven't found that. We found that people want to watch good stories no matter what language they're in. And so we're really trying to do an international expansion right now. So part of my job is going to film festivals, talking to filmmakers, making presentations, like this is how you submit to Opdocs. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for, um, et cetera. I think that's my job. Awesome. I just, it's not a typical, There's that's not a typical day. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in post-pandemic time, is there a, a typical yeah, day? That is a good point. That's certainly something we'll be talking about in this class. So I know you said you're fairly new to this role. 
Um, a lot of our students here are going to be folks that are just trying out journalism for the first time. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background. I know you mentioned you studied art school, but sort of what led you on these steps to um, being working in this wonderful nexus of documentary and journalism? Sure. So I, yes, I, I went to art school. I was a painting major. Um, well, I did that for two years. Um, and then I realized that I really wanted to do something that had to do with the real world. I realized my imagination like wasn't good enough to like make art from my imagination and that the real world was like more interesting to me. Um, and so I went and my original plan was like, I'm going to make documentary films. I think I had just seen like the Buena Vista Social Club or something. <laughs> documentary, and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And then I went, I transferred to American University and I took one film class. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, the video has to be perfect. And the audio has to be perfect. And like, just the idea to focus on those two things was like so overwhelming to me. I was like, this is too much. So then I just focused on the visual stuff. So I ended up studying photojournalism and graphic design. Um, and then I got an internship at the Washington Post when I was graduating. And as a night weekend digital photo editor, um, which was honestly like thinking back now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was, my days off were Monday and Tuesday, and I worked four to midnight um, the rest of the time. And the most amazing thing, like, I feel like I got very lucky in when I decided when I went into digital journalism because it was the very beginning. And so nobody was paying that close of attention. Like the websites were still kind of an experiment. And so they could, they would have someone like an intern who had just like was you know, had barely graduated or hadn't even graduated yet, um, working alone with one other person to run the whole homepage of the Washington Post. I mean, and it was, it was kind of crazy. This was in 2005, 2006, there was a lot of news. And <laughs> so it was very, it was kind of amazing because I feel like I got a lot of responsibility really quickly. And it was mainly because everybody was like, oh, that's the website. The real newspaper is, you know, paper. Um, and yeah, so I did that for a while. And then there were some people starting to experiment with digital video at the Washington Post. And I was like, maybe I can handle the video and the audio now. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm good enough now. And so I started following them around, um, carrying their tripods and learned how to do video basically on the job and um, started doing video full time, like 2008, 2009. Um, and then worked as a video journalist um for many years which was like you know it was then called one man band <laughs> one person band video journalism um which meant that I was like carrying the camera and the tripod and doing the interview and setting up the camera and the lighting and the audio and doing the interview and then bringing it back and doing the editing and then putting it on the internet um so, I mean, looking back now, I'm like, how did I do that? But at the same time, I feel like it was a really good learning experience because I really do know how to do all of the different parts of, of um, making a video, although I'm my knowledge is now completely outdated. But um, so I did that for a while. Uh, I ended up uh, going on a fellowship and then I went to the New York Times and I wanted to do interactive stuff. I was like much more interested at that point in like doing less linear video and doing more stuff that really took advantage of the internet. So working with graphics and interactive storytelling and like text and then video and then text and then video. And I did that for a little while. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I really wanna make videos now. There's always been this thing about making video at a newspaper, which is like, it's not the thing. Mm -hmm. like it's never going to be the thing. The thing at a newspaper is always going to be like words and still images. And then maybe not always, but it still is. Even, you know, I've been doing this for how long and I've been like, and it's always been not the main output. And so part of me was thinking like, I want to make videos for a place where people are like, I want to watch a video and they go there instead of being like, I want to read the news and maybe they click on my video. So the New York Times was launching a television show um, on FX and Hulu 
this was in 2018. Um, and so I got a job as a director producer on the New York Times television show, which was making much longer things. So um, made things from 30 minutes to an hour, um, long episodes on anything from like, I did one story where I was following around a musician um, who had gotten, who had just been released from jail and had been signed to a $4 million record deal upon getting out of jail. And I followed him for his first year as he like learned about the record industry, tried to make his first album and went on tour did everything from that to doing a couple of stories about, um, you know, cartels in Mexico, like very different kinds of stories. Um, but it was a really great experience. And then, uh, I guess, yeah. And then I did that for a while. I worked on a different project at the times and then this job on Opdocs opened up and I was ready. I think I was at a point where I had been making my own stuff for a really long time. And I think I felt like I had kind of lost some, some sense of inspiration. And so I thought going and working in a job where I got to watch other people's work would be inspiring. And it has been, it's been amazing. I think when you're making your own stuff, you're so like laser focused on exactly what you're working on and just the opportunity to like see short films from Korea and Argentina and talk to these filmmakers and journalists from all over the globe and they have amazing ideas and um has been really helpful so that's where I am now wow so you have had what you just said right there for instance with the New York Times TV show you have really done all kinds of stories um yeah. all all over the place one of the things that we're focusing on with it being an intro to journalism class is helping people think about how do you uncover a good story and how do you decide what might be interesting for your, for your readership, which is of course going to differ a lot based on the media, based on the area. But I was wondering if with all this diverse experience, if you have some overall tips for beginning journalists about how to spot a good story, how to, how to think about um, you know, saying, hey, that's something that maybe I should follow up on. Uh, my feelings around this have changed very significantly over the course of my career. I think I, I think when I first uh, started, it was like the idea was whatever was going to be like the big investigative story was going to be the big thing that I should focus on. And what I have realized since is honestly, it's the best stories happen when they're whatever you are obsessed with and become mm -hmm. obsessed with. Like, when I realize that I'm like staying up at night, not anymore on Twitter, but um, like becoming obsessed with a story, becoming obsessed with what's happening here, what's going on here. And it's something that I'm caring about. Like that is the first thing for, for a successful story, because I think, you know, especially in video work, like you're probably going to be immersed in something for a long time. And it better be something that you're kind of obsessed with. Um, I would say that oftentimes the most amazing thing that has, that happens all the time is like some people call it, I don't know which paragraph they call it, but they call it like the ninth paragraph where that graph, sometimes people call it as well. The, the nut I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Well, the ninth paragraph story is like, you're reading a story about something and it's about this like topic, this big topic. And then somewhere in like, you know, they tell you what the whole story is about. And then somewhere in like the ninth paragraph, there's, or, or somewhere around there, there's some little detail mm -hmm. or some person that they've interviewed that they've only gotten one quote from. And you're like, that is actually more interesting. Oh. Or that, and I feel like yeah. that is actually what happens a lot. Like what's so interesting to me is the number of people who are pitching stories to us at OpDocs. Mm -hmm who their story idea came from a story that they read in the New York times. Uh -huh. There was a tiny detail in there. They followed up on it. And that is how they found this interesting, fascinating story that like the, re the original reporter hadn't necessarily been focusing on because they were uh -huh. focusing on this big overarching story. Um, so I would say those are two things I would say also, um, I don't know, you know, it's the the typical stuff of like 
being curious. Like if you're curious about something, just ask about it. And oftentimes there's a story about everything. There can be (laughs) a good story about everything. I mean, I am a true believer that like, you know, if you think about, I often think about, you know, this American life or podcasts where they're not that newsy. And sometimes the stories are about the most mundane things, but they do say something about the human experience. And they say something about who we are as humans. And it's in the storytelling that it becomes a great story. I mean, obviously this is all, this is much more related. I'm talking much more in terms of like feature storytelling. News storytelling is, news journalism is an entirely different thing. Um, where I feel like I didn't do as quite as much of that, but I do think that honestly, the, the, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I didn't do as much of that, but I'm trying to remember from when I did, I don't know. I just feel like if you just talk to people, you will find the story. Like, I think I often, or I sometimes see people like Go- trying to Google their way into finding a story. Uh-huh. And I'm like, that is, it's just, it so rarely works. It's not going to work. Like <laughs> just call someone. And then when you call that person, ask them for like, who else do you think I should talk to? And they will always have somebody else you should talk to. And then no matter, like, that is the way that it often happens is like, you talk to the first person and the first person might not be useful and might not have something interesting or new to tell you, but they'll tell you somebody else and somebody else and somebody else, and then you'll get it. But I feel like it rarely ever happens without picking up the old fashioned telephone. Or going on the old fashioned street and actually talking to a human. (laughs) Also that, yes. That's awesome. So one other thing we're going to be talking about a lot in this class, um, and this is something I can't speak to as much because my own journalism experience was so far away, but some of the unique challenges that are facing contemporary journalists, what would you say some of the biggest challenges that you face as somebody working in your particular medium are? I would say the biggest challenge that has developed over the past like 15 years or 20, I don't know how many years. I don't, I I often don't like to think about how long I've actually (laughs) lived because it makes me very depressed, but um is distrust in the media. Like there is nothing that is more frustrating and I think detrimental to our democracy than um, than a lack of understanding of what happens at news organizations and how they work and sort of the, you know, how the serious news organizations, how seriously they take it and how seriously they take fact checking and dual sources. And like, I mean, I don't, I just feel like the distress in the media, my dream in life is that there's some sort of exchange program at some point where people who don't trust the media and people who work in journalism and think media, the media is like totally pure. Neither side is like completely right, but that they like do a little swap for, they like swap jobs for like a month. I just think it would be incredibly valuable because I think people don't understand that like at a place like the times and at the post and these, and a lot of most news organizations, you know, there's so much care put into getting things right. So much care, so many lines of editing, like, you know, you have, so much work on one story. And I think if people saw that, and also people saw that, like, no one wants to get a correction, like a correct, getting a correction on your story is like, that'll go in your performance review. You know, it's like, I I just distrust in the media. It's the thing that makes me like the most sad because I think if we can't trust our, the information that we're getting, then we're all in big trouble. Um, I would say like, obviously the polarization in the country has made it really hard to to do jobs because sometimes people won't people who have differing viewpoints won't want to even share their viewpoint with you because they don't trust you and at that point then you can't share their viewpoint mm-hmm. with the audience and it just feels so sad um so i'd say those are two of the biggest problems i'd say the other biggest problem that i see that i have less experience with because i work at a big news organization, but I can see it happening is just the 
what's happening to local news. Mm -hmm. And I just find it terrifying. The fact that like, no one is looking into what's happening in this city council and this board and like, there could be corruption happening and what's happening with this school system. And like the fact that local news has lost the business model just hasn't, you know, hasn't been able to work is really terrifying. So I'd say those are to me, the biggest issues in journalism right now. So I like, I like that exchange program idea. If you ever get it running, I think that could be a story in and of itself. <laughs> well, the last big question I had for you is if you could talk a little bit about some of your favorite projects, maybe one or two things, whether that's in your current role or one of the previous ones that stand out and tell us a little bit about the story and why it was so, you know, awesome for you. Sure. So I would say uh, one of, one of my favorite projects I've had the chance to work on was a short film I did in 2016 with um, a colleague of mine and it was called The Forger and it was about a man named Adolfo Kaminsky who during the Holocaust forged documents for children to escape and he had basically not told his story because obviously forging documents is illegal and so we interviewed him when he decided to like go public which was he was 91 when we interviewed him and he told these amazing stories. It was also, he was also coming out with a book with his daughter that had, that told the whole story. So we interviewed him along with his daughter and he told these just incredible stories of heroism. And, you know, he talked a lot in that story about, it was in 2016 when, when, you know, the European refugee crisis was really in the news. And he talked a lot about, you know, what borders mean and what they don't mean and what, what when something is illegal but if it's the right thing to do the philosophy of like how he did something that was illegal but was able to live with himself for you know and 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 sort of knew he did this and he did it completely silently and he didn't tell anybody and he didn't get any like when we when we interviewed him he was just like an old man living in a regular apartment in Paris like shuffling around walking around nobody knew who he was and he was this like giant hero who had saved thousands of lives. Anyway, and we decided to tell that story because everything happened in the past. Um, we were like, how are we going to show this visually? So we decided to sh use paper shadow puppetry oh, wow. um, to animate his past. And so we hired a shadow puppetry theater company to help us animate the, his story. Um and yeah, and I just, I, I think the, you know, because it was like paper, he was working in paper, they worked in paper, he was working in the shadows, it was shadowy. Um, and I just feel like that project, it like, just getting to listen to somebody like that, listen, listen to their words while you're editing and, and like living in, in the world with someone who did such great things, like just, you know, being in the editing bay even, it was just like such an amazing experience. And um, he actually, he just passed away this past year. Um, but I think somebody's making a longer feature length film about him. But anyway, the film is called The Forger and it's on the New York Times website. Awesome. Um, I'll make sure we provide a link to that. <laughs> yeah, so that was one that I really liked. I, I would say, yeah, I would say two other ones and I'll, I'll go quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, one of them was the the musician story that I was telling you about, which was for the New York Times television show. Um, the musician, his name is Dominic Fike. He's um, now, he's become a much bigger deal than when I was filming with him because he was on the TV show Euphoria. Like he's really oh, okay. like, okay. his career is like really done great things. But what was amazing to me about that was I hadn't, you know, getting to watch and film someone making art that I didn't understand and getting wa to watch a musician, like pulling melodies out of thin air and pulling lyrics out of thin air and getting to watch the creation of an album from beginning, from like the first like attempts at a melody for a song to the end where he's performing it in at a huge music festival in front of tens of thousands of people it was just like such an amazing experience about the creation of art and also like learning how the story also delves into like how the music industry works today mm -hmm. and how it differs from how the music industry used to work you know 
the role of labels and the role of social media and how the artists and authenticity are more important than like marketing. And um, it was just a fascinating story to work on. Plus it, I was just like hanging out with the coolest like 23 year olds you could ever imagine. <laughs> really cool. um, so that one, and then another one that I love um, was for the New York Times video unit in 2017, I think, which was um, the 2017 was the year of like the summer of hell in terms of the MTA, the New York City subway system. Oh yeah. yeah. And so um, I worked on a video that was explaining how it came to be. So I worked with a report with a few reporters at the times who um had done these investigations into like all the political decisions that had led up to why the system had gotten so bad. And I worked with the most amazing producer, um, Ora de Kornfeld, and she she and I worked together on this piece for a while. And we ended up trying to make, there's something, there was something humorous about, there was something like, there's something so New York about when things are going terribly and yet everybody's able to laugh at it. <laughs> but like, I felt like we were trying to capture and I feel like we, we compiled a bunch of Twitter videos and edited them together and we tried to make it, it's it's funny, which mm -hmm. I had never really tried to do. I think journalism should often try to maybe be funny occasionally, <laughs> like it should always be doom and gloom. And um, even if the story is serious and it was serious, but we tried to make it engaging. And that one's called, your train is delayed, why? <laughs> in the New York Times. <laughs> Well, that definitely talks about speaking to your direct audience, right? Yeah. That's the thing that I'm sure everybody was thinking about. Yeah. So I always tell the students that before any interview ends, we should always say, is there anything you want to add? Because you can sometimes get the best questions out of that. So Alex, is there anything you want to add before we go? Um, I would just say that I feel, I still feel like I did like 20 years ago that the real world is so much more interesting than any of our imaginations. And I think it's, it's an exciting time to be telling real stories. There's so much going on all the time and yeah. And email me if you have any questions. How about that? <laughs> That's awesome. I, <laughs> you might get inundated. Thank okay. you so much, Alex. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me.